Hey everyone, Pushing Up Roses here, and recently I fell down a rabbit hole. A monkey's rabbit hole. Here we come. You see, I was planning on doing a video about the monkeys, and in my research, I happened upon one of the most insane movies I've ever seen, Invisible Mom 2. You're probably wondering how this relates to the monkeys. Well, as you can see here, this is Mickey Dolenz. He plays a key role in this movie alongside other well-known sitcom actor, Justin Barefield from Malcolm in the Middle, and Dee Wallace Stone, who graced us with her presence in an episode of Murder, She Wrote, one I actually did a video on, so if you watched that one, she should look familiar to you. So I stopped all production on my monkeys video to talk about this bonkers movie because nearly every scene is ridiculous. I was pleasantly surprised to see Mickey in a lead role because he was my favorite monkey. Wait, isn't it Mike Nesmith? Who's my favorite monkey? Here's what his monkey brother, Davy Jones, had to say about him. Uh, Mickey could be the funny one because he's funny. He looks funny. So I was ready to be entertained. Unfortunately, I was entertained in the wrong way, in the MST3K way. In fact, this movie is so nuts that it might be a long video because I feel like I need to talk about every scene. I should also mention that there is an Invisible Mom 1, but I didn't watch it. Nor did I need to, because this movie reuses a lot of footage from it. Invisible Mom 2 was directed by Frank Olin Ray. Is it Frank or Fred? Fred! Oh my god, what a terrible typo. I'm fixing that right now. Invisible Mom 2 was directed by Fred Olin Ray, a producer, director, and writer who has been involved in over 200 low-budget films, sometimes even medium-budget. Always no consistency. This man does not have a niche or a specialty, which is always a great sign. Most recently, he's been directing cheesy Christmas flicks, which is honestly a good bandwagon to ride. Those things can be terrible as hell and still lure in an audience with their emotionally exploitative nature. Picture it. The Chicago Art Institute. On a dark and stormy night, a man gurgles in his sleep. He is unfortunately dying of these gurgles, but his niece and nephew aren't too concerned about it. This is Bernard, who will not allow anyone to call him Bernie. And don't worry, this is gonna become a recurring gag. Bernie. The name is Bernard. Uncle Randolph. Bernard St. John. Bernard. Shut up, Bernie! Bernard! George Bernard Shaws. Bernard. George Bernard Shaws. And this is his sister, Olivia. They really want their uncle to die so they can claim their inheritance. Oh, come closer, both of you. Smell my breath. I'm not going to leave you one thin dime. <laughs> All right, whoever is on the triangle is really rocking their part in this music. <laughs> What's this nonsense about our not getting any inheritance? Bernard and Olivia ask the family lawyer why they aren't getting any money, and this second-rate Robert Stack says that they're not the only living relatives. There's some very confusing dialogue. We find out that this guy, Uncle Randolph, had a grandson. It was thought that he died with his mother in a car crash. However, there were no death records, so the lawyer hires a detective to find him. By now, he should be about 12 years old. What? You waited that long to find this kid. With the computer-assisted tracking, we're likely to find a boy by this time next week. Oh, computer-assisted tracking? How? What? Explain? Man, this is such a strange Diet Adams family. Let me explain something real quick. This movie has a very complicated backstory, and because of that, it likes to remind us, all the time, about what's going on. Right away, without any mystery, Bernard just blurts out that he cut the brake line to Randolph's son's car. He died alongside his wife and their kid. Randolph's grandson. Well, that's what they presumed. The bodies of the mom and son were never found. I cannot believe we're not even five minutes into this movie and we already know who the murderer is. I guess it's a how catch him now. Also, can't they just kill their uncle now? Like before they find the kid? All right, let's watch these dodgy looking credits. Huh, this music is so familiar. What is this? Wait. Is that the Terms of Endearment theme song? Oh my god, it is! I can't believe I just extracted that from my brain. What in the world? Man, it's been a while since I've watched that and cried in my bed all night. After the credits, we hop to the orphanage, who unfortunately cannot afford a new sign. You know that font came directly from a computer program. What is that? Lucita handwriting or something? Nope, it's brush script STD regular. You're welcome. The children love to come around the fountain. Phrasing. Today, two people are there to see Edward, a little imp who is absolutely in no way inspired by Kevin McAllister. Ah! 
You see, Eddie doesn't want to be adopted because he believes his mom will eventually come get him, so he scares away potential parents. No, Edward, I'm your mommy. I love how they didn't show the prank actually working because it probably wouldn't have, so we just cut straight to having the bucket on this woman's head. This guy is just overwhelmed. <laughs> Unfortunately, since he is 12, he can no longer stay at the orphanage and he must be put into foster care. You'd think they would have told him that before he started pranking people for all those years. Holy cow, we're getting a lot of characters thrown at us at once. After all these weeks, after all this trial and error, it's ready. The perfect IPA. This is the Griffin family, Laura, Carl, and their son, Josh. Carl is a scientist who invents frankly dangerous concoctions. Wait, another character? Who is this? We barely met the others. I must tell you, I was so confused to see this old-timey radio playing old-timey news. Meanwhile, see Biscuit wins over crowds as the stock market crashes. Apparently this movie is set in the 40s or 50s, I'm not sure. It's really confusing. There's a lot of references to it being the 50s, but then some of the settings are absolutely from the 90s and the clothing, to be honest. So this woman is indeed Edward's mom, who did not die. She hears about detectives trying to find him on the news, since he's the heir to a fortune, so she decides to finally search for him. Eddie's social worker calls Laura and asks if they consider taking him in as a foster since they've had foster kids before. Laura is so excited and overwhelmed by having another kid in the house that she does this weird thing with her hands and disappears. Damn, when I'm excited, I just have the strong urge to pee. Don't worry, this movie reiterates what happened in the first Invisible Mom. Dad explains that two years have passed since she accidentally drank an invisibility formula that was left out and it is slowly leaving her system. Unfortunately, it still acts up when she gets excited. Excited, or just feels any emotion at all. That night, Uncle Randolph dies of mysterious circumstances. Bernard and Olivia start to celebrate, then Preston, family lawyer, comes in with the bad news. <gasps> oh no! Ew, a child. Apparently, after 12 years, they found Eddie. He says he was found before Randolph's passing, so the fortune still goes to him. He also says the kid will be arriving the next day. I'm sorry, are you plotting in front of me? Can you wait just a second? Preston wants them to leave, but they realize if they are the boy's only living relatives, technically they can adopt him and stay in the house. So are these two banging, or...? Edward gets to the Griffins the next day and what, 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 what? How did Preston find him if he just got placed into a foster family? And I thought he was supposed to be going to the estate today. What is going on? This is Eddie Brown. We dressed him in brown so you wouldn't forget. Josh and Eddie are bonding over comics and horror movies when Josh drops this bomb. Like sometimes when my mom gets a little stressed and her blood pressure goes up, she turns invisible. Uh, maybe don't say that. We get a flashback to what happened in Invisible Mom 1, where Carl is working on the invisibility formula. Hmm, let me just test it on this animal. Apparently, Carl wanted to use it for shenanigans, so he hid it in a soda bottle, which his mom found and drank from. Not sure putting it on top of an entertainment center counts as hiding. This causes her to turn invisible. Wow, that towel is not moving. Eddie wants to see the formula so he can experiment with it, but... The government came and took it and that was that. Thanks, Obama. Or... Eisenhower? Over in the parents' room, there is canoodling. Mrs. Griffin. Yes, John Denver. Meanwhile, at the Art Institute, some random neighbor woman happens to be walking by completely bone dry during all this thunder and lightning, and it is here that I would like to address the door knocker situation. Was nobody supervising the prof team? First of all, it's not even on there securely. And second of all, it's not even on the door. It's just on a random ass plank of wood that's been glued to the window. At least the lamp game is on point. Sort of. Anyway, this scene just shows the neighbor being concerned that she heard screaming in the house. It goes on for way too long and we don't even ever learn this character's name. It's prank time. Carl and Josh smear some soap on clean plates. So I guess their parents eat soap and look. I'm no prankster myself, but shouldn't they put it in cups? Wouldn't that be more effective? Oh, they did put it in the cups. They just chose not to show that part, which was a choice. Full transparency, I had absolutely no idea why this was happening because I was looking for something to happen with the plates. The social worker shows up at the Griffin household with Bernard and Olivia, who are there to adopt Eddie. They show up with no proof, identification, or paperwork. Eddie is excited to find out that he's a millionaire, but doesn't want to leave the Griffins. Laura isn't impressed with the siblings and gets so upset she turns invisible. Well, all for her clothes. She takes the opportunity to mess with Olivia, and yes, that means she is naked the entire time. The siblings take Eddie back to the estate that night, 
night, but Josh wants to spend the night in the new mansion, so he hides in the back of their car so he can sneak in later. Meanwhile, just up the street, it's lightning and thunder. It never stops, actually. The Sibs tell Eddie that the house is haunted, then lock him in his room, plotting his eventual accidental demise so they can be sole owners of the estate. Operation scared to death can start at any time. Sir, that's not how code words work. Josh has now infiltrated the house, ready to help his friend. There's some very strange behavior going on down at the St. John Estate in the Diamond Hills development. I'm sorry, who is this? The neighbor lady makes a complaint against the evil sibling, saying that she heard screams and moans, which is exactly what I hear from the upstairs apartment most days, so I don't see the problem. Cop number two tells her that they will send somebody to investigate right away. Josh's parents eventually discover he's missing, realizing that he sneaked out with Eddie. Sir. This is an Arby's. This shot of the family lawyer is giving me serious 1980s law show vibes. What is this office? Look at these walls. Eddie's mom comes back and talks with Preston, hoping to get her son back from his evil cousins. She also makes the bold claim that they will kill her son, just like they killed her husband. You can prove they murdered your husband? I don't have to prove it, I know it. Oh, okay. Josh finds his way into Eddie's room. Man, it must really suck living next to a spotlight factory. Seriously, what is all this lightning? It's striking every two seconds. Are they living on top of a Tesla coil? The siblings get into scary costumes to begin their plan and also put on a record of scary sounds and eerie ambience called hulas? Uh, so we're about 53 minutes into this movie called Invisible Mom 2, and there is not much invisible momming happening, just a bunch of shenanigans. Booga, booga! <laughs> Starting to get the feeling this isn't about an invisible mom. The kids manage to find a phone and call Laura. Are you all right? Yeah, mom, we're fine. You look, you gotta come get us, we're in trouble. That was an emotional roller coaster of a sentence. Are you fine or are you in trouble? We're fine. You look, you gotta come get us, we're in trouble. Laura calls the police, who isn't taken seriously when she says her boys are being chased by ghosts. She is so anxious, she begins to turn invisible. Can you imagine living like this? You have to go through life not feeling any emotion because it can trigger you to disappear. And your clothes don't go with you, so you can't even really sneak around unless you want to risk doing it naked. So she tries to sneak around, trying not to be seen, in a trench coat and a hat, even though she could just not. <laughs> She could just not have to do that if she just didn't wear it. This disguise is pointless. Olivia finds the kids and attempts to poison them, but discount Rick Morana shows up just in time to distract her. They toss the tainted drink into a plant and it expires dramatically. <laughs> I have never felt so bad for a plant in my entire life. Unfortunately, as soon as dad gets there, Bernard locks him in the dungeon and bonks him on the head with a pipe. Upon closer inspection, that might be part of a pool noodle. Meanwhile, the kids find a secret door in what appears to be a real skeleton. Some of these scenes really, really remind me of a monkey's episode, especially with the presence of Mickey Dolenz. They're gone. They're gone. Maybe that's why he was chosen for this role, though I do wish there were more monkey-like things in this movie. That would have really upped the zany of it. I don't like that Mickey is playing an antagonist. It just feels off. The chase continues. Olivia tries to scare the kids with a new costume and the piano starts playing on its own. The cops are staking out the place when they see Laura just blatantly sneaking around the property. I hope no one sees me. She decides the best thing to do is to strip, which blows this cop's mind. She's doing it slowly too. I think this guy just found a new kink. Laura is finally using her powers correctly and manages to get into the house unseen. She also manages to find the boys. Olivia finds Laura as she starts to reappear. <gasps> Don't ask me why I'm naked. She wraps herself in a blanket and she is also thrown in the dungeon. This is really beginning to look like Maniac Mansion. Turns out Uncle Randolph was a little freak. He has a dungeon full of cages and shackles and torture devices. Laura informs the Sibs that she has called the police and that they are on their way. Police won't come out unless a crime has actually been committed, especially to the St. John estate. And probably not even then. You know, this is decent commentary on the police. These villains are woke. Nice try. <laughs> Yeah, that's right, I sniff my nose at you. Oh good, Eddie and Josh found a weapon, great. Now they can defend themselves. Or, I mean, pick locks. They find a set of keys in Olivia's room and then he just leaves the sword? Why? They also find the Hula's record. You remember, the record with the scary sounds on it, allegedly. They play it to get Bernard and Olivia's attention, and wow, the acoustics of this giant mansion are amazing. I can't believe sound travels all the way down to the dungeon. They must have some sick surround sound. Is it just me or do these shackles look kind of comfy? They're nicely padded. Evil Sibs are lured into Bernard's room and the kids quickly make their way to the dungeon. Bernard reverse Fonzies the record player, which is interesting. 
Why is it interesting, you may ask? Because Vicky Dolenz actually auditioned for the role of the Fonz. Hey. There's 15 minutes left in this film and there really doesn't need to be. It's more padded than these damn shackles. So let's speed it up. Mom is anxious and turns invisible again. Kids release mom. Mom trolls Bernard a bit and it looks absolutely hilarious. Then she does this goth dance in a ghost costume. Why did you kill me? pretends to be the ghost of the man they killed, and now they're convinced the estate is haunted. The piano starts up again because it just can't resist being jaunty, and the Sibs are so freaked out, they confess immediately to the police so they can go to jail away from the ghosts. Laura makes a dress out of a curtain like she's Maria Von Trapp just before the family lawyer shows up. What in the hell took him so long to get there? It feels like days have gone by. Eddie is reunited with his mom, and they get to live in the St. John estate together. I'm sorry it took so long. Can you ever forgive me? The music in the background is... an interesting choice for such a serious, sentimental scene. But wait, there's a twist. The mansion might actually be haunted? And that was Invisible Mom 2. What a confusing, weird, disjointed movie. I understand this is supposed to be a campy, fun film for a younger crowd, but does that mean we just throw basic fundamentals like plots out the window? The best thing about this movie is the set design. The designers looked like they had a great time with this mansion. It's so much. I also think Mickey Dolenz is a decent actor. I have always really liked him. But like I stated before, it's so weird seeing him as the villain. Especially when there have been several Monkeys episodes featuring the band stuck in a haunted mansion or a castle inhabited by monsters, so while it makes sense for him to be in this movie, I just feel like the character wasn't very fitting for him. But hey, maybe this is the movie that jump-started Justin Burfield's career? Would we have Malcolm in the Middle had we not had Invisible Mom 2? Who knows? Who knows? The good news is there's an Invisible Dad film, and an Invisible Dog film, and about a bajillion movies from director Fred Olin Ray. We are not done with him yet, oh no. We will be diving into his work more in the very near future. I'm coming for you, Fred, and your weird yet intriguing adult films. If you have a suggestion for a Fred Olin Ray film I should review in the future, please leave me a comment. A lot of the content I cover comes directly from viewer recommendations. And until next time, stay visible. Hey everyone, thanks again for watching my video on Invisible Mom 2, a movie I didn't even know existed until a couple months ago. If you want to see more from me, I have plenty to offer, but first I want to give a shout out to my lovely patrons. If you're interested in supporting the channel or you want a Goosebumps postcard for Halloween, consider checking out my campaign. Otherwise, dropping a comment and a share is always free. If you want to see more from me, I have a few recommendations on the screen. On the left, we have an episode from my flagship series, That Time on Murder, She Wrote, and on the right, I have another breakdown about a movie with a talking dog. Trust me, you do not want to miss it. Thanks again, and as always, I will see you in the next one.